Great. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Shimon. Uh, I think I need now to own up for everything or for part of the things that uh, we just uh, Barbara wrote some checks on, which uh, we'll do gladly. Um, what I want to do is uh, take you through the product. Um, obviously, the UI is a good beginning, but I'll also deep dive into um, shell and run some commands, show you some performance. Uh, I hope nobody's uh, shy of that. Quick question um, before you start. HTML5 interface? Yes. Yeah, you, you don't need to <coughs> download any Java. Java. Uh, it should look better. Good news. Yes, Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Great. Uh, and by, by the way, that's a good start. Um, we, we're really proud of our UI. Uh, you just connect your browser to one of our storage nodes. The, the UI pops up. You, you authenticate, and get, you don't need to download anything. Uh, it's funny because we, we get a lot of questions of why do you even have a UI? You, you're like a distributed file system. Nobody is used to like fancy management. Just just work through the CLI. So the bottom line is that we have a very nice CLI also that allows you to automate everything. Uh, and we have customers that have uh, environments that are being uh, uh, created and demolished on the on demand using our uh, CLI using the automation. But uh, I personally love to work with our UI. I think it's. Uh, Sorry, before you start to, to yes. share, so this is a already functioning cluster. For the installation yes. process, is just a, like an IPT, APT get, something like that, or do we, uh, do we need question. a PAHD to start? Uh, Great. Uh, <laughs> the way to install a Weka cluster, and actually I, pre I also prepared a demo of installing a Weka cluster, which is like uh, five minutes, so it's too long for this session, but I can share it with you. Uh, you, you download uh, from our website. Um, a package, you run the package on your servers, so that's basically installing a minimum cluster, uh, and then you, you, you actually teach the, the servers that you installed about the cluster that they, uh, they are part of. So for example, I have uh, six servers, I have 100 servers, I just run my uh, script on them to, to deploy work on them, and then I'm running another script or going through a very nice UI wizard that just teach them that they're all part of the same cluster. I can do also with Ansible and stuff, yeah. so to automate. You can have process. Runcible run our, our uh, CLI that will do it for you, yes. Okay. And actually, again, as mentioned, I have a demo for that. If we'll have time, I'll gladly show it. If not, I'll share the video. It's basically setting up a Weka cluster, um, it, several minutes, and I'm making a bold claim, but maybe you'll be able to see it. Um, so yes, this is a live running cluster. It's in our lab. We have a lab actually not far from here. Um, we're currently connected. It's not a demo. It's just, yeah. and we'll go through this, uh, uh, I think, uh, over the demo. So what do we see here? Um, Shimon, can I ask you a quick sure, question? Definitely. Can you make the font bigger? No, that's it. Oh. <laughs> that's too much. I'm not that's too it. much. Is that better? It's a little bit better, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's much better. Yeah, oh, that's good. Great. Uh, I'm getting a glare here, but probably, I hope you don't see it. Anyway, so what do we see here? Just as a brief overview, see, this is the main dashboard of the UI. Uh, you see like a very nice representation of all of your servers that are running Weka. Uh, the green uh, uh, squares are the cores that Weka is using on that server. So for example, um, uh, you don't need to count, by the way. There's a... You can deep dive into each server. The, the white rectangles are the SSDs or the NVMe uh, that we're using per server. Uh, and definitely, you, this is a very nice representation. You can go in and look at your server, uh, verify the version that it has installed, cores, their types also, um, and the devices that you have over there. We, we don't expect you to manage a 100 nodes cluster or a 1,000 nodes cluster through the UI, even though you could. Uh, but it's, it's really a really good starting point to understand our architecture and to take a one-shot view at all of your cluster and see if there's a red indication for any failed components. Um, and again, everything that you can do from here, you will also do with the CLI if needed. So these are our storage nodes. And, and by the way, definitely ask me a question if I'm running too fast. These are our storage so, nodes. Shimon, if, um, if you're running in AWS, would it look similar to this? OK, great question. This is how it looks like on AWS. Quite similar, right? It's actually the same binary, same code, same okay. everything. Um, you, you smaller would... nodes? Sorry? Maybe smaller nodes? Uh, yeah, these no, are small no, instances. No, because because you have there less are less cores. Disks. Exactly. These are um, 
i3 to extra large instances on AWS. Uh, by the way, we have another cluster here, which is i3 16 extra large on AWS. So we, we're not limited. You can install on, according to the customer, we actually also have a very nice calculator that the customer uh, says, hey, I want that much capacity and that much performance on AWS. And we tell them, uh, you need to provision th these amounts of these hosts, of these instances, or, or a different number. Just on that point, uh, what's our scale down? How, what's the smallest uh, point of entry we can use to start Six. from? Six? Six. Uh -huh. Great. Great. And you can scale down the cluster any minute. So if I don't need, especially in, on AWS, if I don't need uh, two of those uh, six nodes anymore, can I so remove six, them? Six is the minimum. So six is the well, minimum. Okay. If I have 10 and I want we, to we go actually, down. That's a great point. We do have customers running in the field, and that's one of them is the one that Barbara mentioned before. Uh, what they're doing is they're starting with a minimum cluster. When they need, they just expand it on the fly. I'll show it through the UI here. Uh, but imagine that you can do it obviously through some automation. You can just add storage nodes on the fly while the cluster is running, while everything is working. You can do it through a wizard or through an API. And uh, you can expand your cluster and then shrink it. The, the lowest that you will shrink it is uh, six nodes. Okay. Um, and when you, when you expand it, you immediately get more capacity, more performance. Over time, we'll also distribute the data across all of the remaining storage. But just by adding more servers, you added more cores. We, so the rebalancing is done lazily. In there, the there's there's um, many layers of rebalance. One of them is the um, CPU, the virtual metadata servers distribution, and that's immediate. So you immediately get more performance by adding more servers. And the rebalancing of the data is, is gradually. Um, and you get some indication. It tells you that's what's going on. So. And actually, if you don't need to compute anything, you can just take a snapshot, push it to AWS S3, and bring down all instances. The next time you would actually want to work with that data, you would spin up the cluster once again. Or let's say you have shrunk down to large instances that costs a lot of money and then six of them is still above your budget, you can always switch to six uh, meager instances that cost less. So you, you actually have quite a lot of flexibility in how you would like I suppose uh, the uh, licensing is uh, on a terabyte basis then and not on a node basis. It's so I terabyte. can change it, everything I want, I need. Yep. Okay. And, and spinning up and spinning down the cluster, how long does that take? Is that a 10 minute job? Actually, Is that we two just hours? did it here while, while Barbara was speaking. 15 minutes, less. Okay. It, mo most of the time that you're waiting for is uh, for AWS to provision the instances to make sure that they're up and running. Mm -hmm. and then our installation on top of it, again, it's the same installation that we do uh, on the physical environment, same binary, same everything. Uh, it's just automated uh, for you on AWS. Mm -hmm. If you spin it up, is there an integrity check or something? Sorry? Check, is, there, is there a process that checks if everything is spun up correctly? The data is consistent? We, we, we're using, um, currently by default, we're using CloudFormation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you actually have a template uh, and you fill that out on a Weka site. I, I can even show it. So you have that website here. And you're asking, hey, I need that amount of capacity, for example. And it says uh, on that uh, type of instance, you need 16 servers. On, on the bigger instances, you need less servers. On the huge instances, you need less servers. This is the minimum capacity that you will get. You just deploy to AWS. It takes you to your AWS account. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it, it, it creates a JSON of a CloudFormation template. And it pushes that and it brings you immediately to the CloudFormation template page on your account. So yeah. you should authenticate. And then all of the means that CloudFormation enforces are, are there. If there's a problem during the provisioning, you will see it. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a resource limit, if uh, something occurred, there's, you, so yeah. we'll get all of that indication. Okay. And any IO is protected by end-to-end -end protection. So we offer yes, the I highest grade to... of integrity protection. So each 4 k is protected individually, and we're storing the end-to-end -end, uh, protection on different media or in, it's an object storage on a different object where the data is actually is. So it's safer than most other storage solutions. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so now, uh, again, everything you wanted to know about Bash and you were afraid to ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm on a, I hope that you can see it. I'll make it a bit bigger even. Okay, so I'm on a, a, a client 
uh, on that physical system that you've seen, okay, in our lab. Uh, that's the client name. How do I know that? Uh, where am I? I'm, this is how a Weka file system looks like to the client. It looks exactly like a local file system. Um, so I'm on uh, MNT Weka FS2. Let's uh, verify that this is a Weka file system and I'm not like saying anything incorrect. Okay, so you can see Weka FS2 is a Weka FS file, file system. So hey, I'm not lying, we're on a Weka FS file system. Uh, it already has some files, obviously, because I pre populated it. I just wanted to show you um, some performance. And I'll get a bit. So uh, we, we, our claim to fame, or one of them actually, we have a few, is that we're faster than a local file system, right? And uh, a local file system will always maximize at your hardware environment, which if, uh, if you take the, the fastest SSD, which is connected by four PCI lanes, and all the star align, you're getting uh, four gigabytes per second, as if. Um, you can see here, we're getting a sustained 11.3 gigabytes per second, single client. Mm. Uh, and by the way, the reason that we are limited to 11.3 is only because we have a one 100 gig e port. If we had, <laughs> so we're, we're basically maximizing the port, right? On the client. If we were to have two ports in that environment, uh, we would have scaled that to 22. Okay, so that's, that's pretty decent performance. What's, I think. what's the size of the cluster, Simon? Th this cluster is, um, you see, it's all of these servers, and the number is 16 servers. Um, th that cluster, by the way, can do an aggregate of uh, uh, more than 90 gigabytes per second. Um, and, and I'm being very cautious when I'm saying 90. It can, I think Leon would say even uh, <laughs> more than twice. But uh, wow. yeah. um, obviously, that client wouldn't saturate it. So just imagine throwing your clients on it. Everybody gets. Now, let, let's do that. So usually, we, we have uh, bold claims, right? So. Okay, so let's run some IOs. Sorry, I want you to see some IOs. Well, so one of our cl the claims that we we made is that we don't get performance um, degradation while we are doing uh, cluster failures, right? So, just starting another uh, write workload, uh, which would get slightly less than 11. I think we'll get, we'll top it like nine point something. Okay. Let it speak a bit. So we're, at, we're doing uh, one meg writes, not even reads, right? Um, at 9.8 gigabyte per second. Now let's, let's be nasty here for a second. Let's kill a node. Live. Live, on a demo. <laughs> what can go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, let's go here. You can see a cluster up and running. All of the nice, everything is nice and green. Uh, actually, you can also see the UI indicating 9.65 sustained gigabyte per second. Again, single client, the aggregate is much more. <clears throat> and uh, let's be nasty here for a second. Okay. What will happen? So. I'll tell you what will happen, and I hope reality will collaborate with me. Uh, we will see a, a node failing. We will see the bandwidth uh, dropping. It will take a few seconds, seconds. Then it will grow back up. OK. We see an, a clear indication of the node. By the way, this is why you have the UI for, because it's very nice to, to see a color coding. Uh, and, and then zoom in and take a look at all of the internal components. Obviously, everything is failed because we just failed the node. This is the part where we hold our breath and wait for the performance to continue, which it will. And also, by the way, you can see that there is a clear indication of uh, the protection level of the system. Okay, um, Because when you failed, there was a, a certain percentage of your data that was that is now um, unprotected. Protected. Oh, it's not really unprotected. It's more like um, it's it's uh, single degraded. It's at risk. 
If we lose a second node with those blocks, we could lose. If you mm, actually, if you lose a second uh, node with two. those blocks, yeah. So by the default, it's uh, plus two. Pa, pa, pa. Where is my? It's support? taking its time to. No, I think maybe my job finished. You only gave it a minute, and you. Were no, no, no. <laughs> I think my job actually just finished. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, if we're talking to uh, time, sixty seconds. Yeah, yeah let, let's restart it and, and see that we can get the same performance that we got before. I didn't run it time based. Oh, it's only sixty seconds. So let, let's give it a go again and see that we're getting the same performance that we did before. So um, mm -hmm. you were doing both random reads and random writes before. Is that? And yeah. now you're just doing random writes. Is that? No. I did random reads before, and I showed 11.5 gigabytes. Right. And now I did random writes, and I showed 9.6 gigabytes per second. And now, while doing random writes, which is like I think the more complicated That's scenario, we crash the server, and you see that even when a server is down, we're getting the 9.7. So obviously, who said performance degradation? Uh, let's do another one, right? Why, why stop at one if we can crash to at the same price? <laughs> Here, we crash too. Now we're going to be ready that uh, yes. this benchmark is going to stop, and we'll just start it again. But uh, basically, you see, we have a node down. We're getting the same performance as we did before. Um, a little bit better. It's it, it, we improved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So better to have a um, so cluster. Here, I think it's completed. Here, let's tolerance. restart it with 60 seconds. Okay. Now, uh, we can see, by the way, that already one of the nodes is uh, starting to go up, right? We can see our benchmark here starting slowly again. And no worries, we'll zap the, the one that came up also, so you'll get to the feeling of two of them down. But um, eventually, what this, is, what this aims to show you is that uh, we claim that uh, during, uh, that obviously we're resilient data-wise to um, at least a single node failure and to a double node failure. And by the way, you can install the system to be resilient to four concurrent failures. Uh, it also shows you that our performance, while being degraded, is not impacted. Again, we're, we're back in the scenario where we have- So, uh, so Simon, when you took those nodes down, uh, you're actually yes. rebuilding the data protection to go yes. back to two level? When, exactly. When at we, the same time, you were doing the random write exactly. at workload? Exactly. So rebuild is going on in the background. All of the nodes participate in the rebuild. While we're doing that, we're uh, still doing the, the IOs, which are still sustained. Now, let, let's kill that node again, because... And, and writes are actually the more difficult IOs in that mode, so we're showing writes. Yeah, I, I don't understand that. So you may have to explain that to me offline. But Because writes are actually, you're creating the data protection on the fly versus... Uh, yeah, and so reading would actually be if you had to read Imagine something that was doing damaged, you'd have to protect it on the fly. Yeah, too. You can show reads. I can show reads as well. Um, I want you to see that two nodes are down, and while we're rebuilding the data, by the way, I'm going to get to that obviously, uh, you can see that uh, the system also tells you hey, some of my data is. Uh, uh, is uh, twice degraded, some of it is single de degraded. You will see that we work harder and faster to make the data single degraded again, okay? Um, and yeah, I think that speaks for itself. Let's, we'll allow them to continue to go up while it's going on. Uh, yeah. How much resources do you need on a node to run uh, the, the file system in terms of RAM and CPU cores? Uh, so that's, it's really adjustable to the performance target that you want to achieve. Uh, you can start as low as one core and one drive. And uh, small, uh, basically, almost any type of CPU that you have out there since uh, 2013. You use uh, RAM for buffers or other stuff? We use a small footprint of RAM for metadata um, in memory. Okay. But uh, we don't uh, utilize any write cache. Everything is stable immediately. When WECA.io acknowledge a write from the client, okay, it's, it, it's immediately on stable storage. So um, actually, I could have shown that as well. If we drop the entire power, it just would have taken a longer time. If we drop the entire power for the data center, everything would go up. Everything would go up immediately. Um, you will not have a 24-hour FSK, for example. Do you plan to add any compression and the duplication uh, feature on top? To my peers for that. 
Uh, def definitely. <laughs> performance. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? But they, if they use a, a little CPU now, they can add yep. uh, features. Well, it looks like all CPU is being dedicated. I wonder if it'll leverage GPU as well for... Um, I don't know. Do, we, do we plan to use GPUs to improve? You mean to, exce to accelerate the um, compression? Not that it's not fast enough to begin with. but well, that, <laughs> that would be an option available to us at some point, but Guys, we're software-defined. Do more wow factors? So we have to be show? flexible yeah. about the hardware that you might mm -hmm. choose to do. Is that a reference architecture? Is that yeah, how we, that we have reference architecture that's uh, detailed on the website. Uh -huh. Uh, and that's an example that people can follow. Mm -hmm. And then we're reasonably flexible about the customer choices. Sure. So, Shimon, um, what did you find out about AWS in terms of the way that the instances are configured? Did you find that uh, some were not very good to use, some are good to use, some? So there's different instance types, uh, each of them with different uh, hardware and footprints and network uh, um, resources. Uh, there are some that are more optimized to, to, what, to what we pr provide. Uh, and we, so within insta each instance up, you have a range, right? Usually we can use the entire range, as you've seen the, the AWS calculator that we showed, and, um, and you'll get different uh, performance. So eventually it's all a matter of performance of what you'll get. I was just wondering whether you found anything that was advertised as being a certain way that turned out not to be as, as oh. optimum like whether the networking was advertised to run at a certain speed and didn't. Or, I, you know, so different instances have different bursting network capabilities. Um, but when you dig deep enough, you, you understand that this is the scenario and, and you, you prepare the customers for that. By the way, for some customers, this is really enough. You bring up a Weka cluster, you can burst for an hour, you, you completed your task because it was plenty fast, you stop the cluster, maybe you'll start it again tomorrow, you'll, you'll burst again tomorrow. So. So you, you don't suffer any latency difference between the, or performance differences between the, the instances, because they are not all the same at the end of the day. A lot of the um, software defined that's running in AWS is running as instances, um, and they're then dependent on uh, something like Elastic Block Services for, for the actual storage piece. So because we're running um, in, uh, with the local storage and leveraging that, we typically don't have some of the issues you see with, uh, with other um, NAS-based systems that run on AWS. Um, so I think that kind of would help as well in terms of understanding. So you're seeing less variability running? Correct, because we're taking the local instances inside those um, I3 instances right. and then clusterizing them versus depending on EBS with provisioned IOPS and all the costs that go with that. So that's a big difference as well with us. No, yes, but, but the instances could be a little bit different from uh, each other. So yeah, but usually what we see is that when customers... Uh, so it's zoom, good enough for, for, uh, for the software still to work. You don't have any timeout issues between the nodes and stuff. Definitely. Okay. At worst, performance will drop down to, the, um, to what the, the instances can provide, but you will never see like disconnect. Or okay. okay. I have a few more wild things that I want to share with you. I, I specifically like very much. So, hey, this is the file system that we worked on. This is the capacity of that file system. Maybe I have one server mounting it. Maybe I have a thousand server mounting it. Uh, maybe I understood that this file system is not big enough for me. I, I want to, to increase it on the fly, right? So definitely it's as difficult as just uh, doing what I'm... <laughs> yes, now let's do DF again. Hey, it's 250. So this, this single thing, uh, when you think about the amount of headache it saves you, in planning ahead, you don't need to plan ahead. You don't need to plan for your metadata and for your data. You don't need to U-mount all of your clients and remount them. You just increase. And by the way, we can shrink also. So that's, that's just, the second question. That's just a POSIX call that you do. <laughs> it's just that, a POSIX call. You yeah, it's very call, easy. So it this is why good, nobody else does it. So you're, it's not hard yeah. to actually achieve. It looks good. Yeah. It will be interesting to see what's going on in the background. While we do it? When you're uh, hitting here the expansion. Uh, as, you could, as you could see, it's immediate. Uh, it's only on our side, it's a metadata structure changes, and uh, you, you get it immediately. We don't need to move data, we don't need to uh, copy data anywhere, it's a metadata construction. This is, why, this is what the system was architected to from day one, to expand, to shrink, to scale. Uh, I still have some more wow factors. So when you say there, maybe I missed something, but when you say it's a tiered file system, so it means that you have some capacity which might be on-premises and you have something on the cloud ah, as well? Great question. This is the next topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. As you can see, and, and let me know if that will answer your question, 
<coughs> as you can see, the system, as, as Barbara mentioned, can tear into an object store, or actually multiple object stores. And these object stores can be on-prem, or they can be on the cloud, right? So you can have a single Weka cluster that has multiple file systems configured on it, and each of these file systems tears to a different object store or a different bucket in an object store. We don't need the entire object store, by the way. We just need a bucket in it. So in this case, I configured the system to, uh, it's, it's a physical system in my lab in, uh, here in, in Fremont. Uh, it's configured to uh, tier to AWS. Once I configured it, I can create a file system, like, for example, this file system, that is configured with uh, flash capacity. So maybe I have uh, 100 terabyte, 400 terabyte flash capacity, but uh, I want uh, only to give it 20 terabyte flash capacity, because I want to save a lot of flash capacity for other file systems as well, but I want its usable capacity to be much bigger. So what you actually saw here is that we present the total capacity of the file system that spans across the on-prem and the cloud tier as well. Okay, we don't present only the flash. As you can see, you're completely unaware of where the data is sitting. And I can already tell you that some of it is sitting in the cloud, some of it is sitting on-prem. Now, um, I think that was your question also. So what well, determines when the data is moved into the cloud? Is that a policy? What determines? A... So there's a few things. There's a few um, internal algorithms that we implemented uh, that does it for you. So f on day one, if you don't touch anything, we will already do it. Uh, according to some uh, heat map, according to creation date, according to last access. We take also smart decisions on parts of file and not just steering the entire file. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously that means that when you're trying to use a file that is also in the cloud, we'll only bring the relevant pieces. And, um, and also we, we allow the customer to give us a hint. Mm -hmm. uh, when does he think on that file system we should tier? When does he think on another file system we should tier? And then there's also uh, what we call a manual prefetch and an automatic prefetch that allows the system to, allows the customer to tell us, hey, I want to make sure that this is on the on-prem because I'm gonna run a job. Or maybe he, he just started running a job and we identified the, the pattern and we automatically bring the rest. Yeah. What this also allows me and is to do snapshots. So I can create snapshots, I can create snapshots that are local Let's take a snap three. Snap three. You know what, sorry, I'll, I'll do the, the entire thing so, so it will be more believable. Here I'm creating a file system, like FS3. I'm gonna say that it's tiered. Maybe I want it to have 10 terabyte, but I want it to have like, I don't know, 500 terabyte in total. I created it. Again, nothing can go wrong, it's a, long, it's a live demo. <laughs> <laughs> When it's the WakeFS, WakeFS 3 MNT. Okay, I just mounted it. Okay, let me create some files here. As you can see, it was tested. <laughs> um, I'm just creating some files. So, I have a file, and by the way, as we said before, you can see that this is my file system. Now, uh, let's, let's create a snapshot for file system three, for WakeFS three. So I'm taking a snapshot. Snap one, snap one. Just took a snapshot, where, do, where will I see it? Obviously on the dot snapshots. You see my snap one. And it's all recorded, so you can look at it slower if I'm running too fast. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you can see the files that I created. These are the files that I took uh, as a snapshot. Obviously, if I'll go to my, uh, uh, <clears throat> to my file system here and just create more files, um, they will not be on my dot snapshots, right? They will be on my file system, but they will not be on my dot snapshots. Right, so um, a snapshot is a point in time. I can always go and take a, a file, a specific files, and obviously we can take thousands of snapshots. You can do it, while the, by the way, while the system is running full of IOs. We, we, I'm, just, I'm just too lazy because we don't have time. But um, you can do it while the system is, is fully running. You don't need to quiesce IOs. But let's say, again, let's say that we have a catastrophe. Somebody um, created junk files, somebody deleted files, some, uh, some ransomware hijacked my file system. While, as, as you can see, I'm, I'm on my file system, I have my 20 files, but now they're junk. Maybe I want to restore my entire file system. 
just like that. See, I just restored it from the snapshot. I didn't need to you mount, remount, change anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. That's nice. Thank you, thank you, thank so, you. Uh, Talk the mic. No, it's not, we, we, we didn't finish it. We didn't finish it. Um, upload to object. I want to, 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 to cash the check that Barbara wrote uh, that we can upload our snapshots to an object store. Then we can drop the entire system, right? So I'm uploading the snapshot to an object store. You can see uh, it, it reports that it completely uh, completed the uh, upload. And uh, let, let's, let's see if uh, we can really work with it. So this is an AWS system that we have. I've prepared in advance, right? Uh, it's also connected to the same object store bucket that we have before, right? And let's create a file system from what we just created. Okay, so <coughs> file system I'm creating, let's say, FS2. It's going to be a tiered file system. Let's say a 10. Sorry, we're on the cloud, so we'll, we'll use smaller numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to cash back, terabytes. right? Um, and then let's do a 10 terabyte. Uh, while you're doing that, um, and, 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 uh, if you don't mind, um, <laughs> this is the fun part. From uploaded Snapchat. snapshots, and I'm giving the snapshot identifier that I just got. And that's it. I created a file system now. Um, Do you plan to support uh, also Google and uh, Microsoft Azure? Thank you. Yep. Oh, man. Sorry. <laughs> okay, can you ask your question also? <laughs> Do you plan to support uh, wow. GCP or Azure I, I as well? I've heard that question before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we do. We actually do plan to continue to expand our cloud. We've spent um, a lot of effort and really just uh, building up our customer base on AWS. Um, and frankly, it's just a function of uh, priorities. So that's definitely on the roadmap. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, well, I just want to complete the the, um, the demo on that part. So um, you can see that I have a file system. I'm, I'm on, currently on my AWS instance, because I have that file name. You can see it. I have my FS2 file system, which I just created. Uh, and if you remember, I just created from the snapshot that I just pushed to the cloud. And uh, let's mount it, right? Let's be root first, because nothing works otherwise. Okay, it will take a few seconds because uh, um, it's the first the mount. Yeah. It's, what, what, what's going on in the background right now is uh, that, that file system is now connecting to what we call a manifest in, in the object store, which when we push the, the snapshot to the object store, we, push the, we made sure that the data and metadata have been uploaded. Now that, uh, that first mount, by the way, the next mounts are gonna be uh, plenty faster, uh, is now reading that manifest and um, make sure it's hydrating from the object store. The metadata the, first so that it knows what's there. Exactly, exactly. And um, the mount completed, MNT FS2, and not surprisingly, we have the same files. How can you believe that I have the same files? Let's MD5 <laughs> some then. So let's MD5 some file 12, right? And let's go here and MD5 some file 12. Okay. Well, what do you think? Will it match? Or? Yeah. <laughs> hey. 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 Looks Amazing. suspiciously alike, right? So it's the same files, and you, you've just been there. We created them together. It's, it's could you could you go into the snapshot directory on the AWS file system because Snap One should be there and all the other stuff, right? If I go to the AWS, what you will see? It's a great question, by the way. You will see. You will see I downloaded uh, the, the snapshots because this is the first snapshot that we hydrated from. So you see it is the downloaded because this is the, the root that we created the file system from. Now, yeah. by the way, you can create more, file, more snapshots. Yeah, I understand that, but why wouldn't it have like snap one at this point? Snap one is a construct of the first system. Maybe the first system called it snap 35. And uh, I don't need to call it snap 35 here. I just need to make sure that this is the snapshot that I created the file system from. Could okay, be that, so, so the, when you mount a file system made from snapshots, you only get that last point in time. I don't get the history. You get everything history. that that snapshot contains. That snapshot. Ah, I, I, have more, I have one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. And by the way, one thing to note is, did you notice that 
the, the file system, uh, the number of nodes that he had on premises versus in the cloud, different numbers, mm -hmm. it can uh, work just seamlessly. Different numbers, different capacities, different instance types, because that was on-prem, that was... Now, l last thing, and I'll, I'll think we, we'll finish with that, is, is a very nice problem. Hey, I'm on my local, this is, this is an AWS system, because again, uh, I, I was constrained, constrained on resources. Um, I'm on... I'm on a directory here. I have, um, I'm, I'm a programmer. I have my, uh, I, I want to untar files. I want to compile files. I want to work with many small files as possible. Who would think that you can do it on a distributed file system, right? Uh, you have to be mad. So obviously we, we're uh, changing that. Um, let's do that. Time, tar. Let's see how, how long does it take to untar on, uh, on a local file system. This is an ext4 uh, partition, right? So, speaking to that, oh, are you going mind? to be Five seeing, seconds? Yeah, are you going to be seeing general purpose IT use of this file system? Because I'm thinking this looks like a nice centralize everything, get rid of a whole bunch of file systems if I need to present over NFS. So what, I back it with Weka. I that, that's a great question. What we're actually seeing is we have had customers where we go in and we're their high performance system on their GPU cluster. And then the engineers say, hey, we kind of really like this. Um, how about we run EDA workload on it? And that actually has happened in a real customer. And then finally they said, hey, you know, we kind of like it. Can we just run our directory share on it? Let's and it continues. We're on it. So Let's we're already our, our have customers where we have three separate <clears throat> use cases uh, within nine months of being in production where they just keep adding to it. They, so they just yeah. slap on more, more usages for it. So suddenly you Do you have a free license for own lamps? <laughs> no, if you want to try it at home, I don't know. On a Raspberry Pi? Yeah. Guys, I want to complete the last, the last uh, piece of yep. the demo. Sorry, well, Raspberry Pi. I, I have a few. Before they, they, they throw me off stage, <laughs> yep. uh, five seconds minimum? on a, no, on a local uh, file system. Can, a local, uh, uh, unprotected Pi. file system. Yeah. And I need it on raspberries. <laughs> come Sorry. on, come on, come on. Oh, I didn't run time. <laughs> <laughs> but you could see the time. You know, they always respond better when you talk to them. It's like, <laughs> ah, so many jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Five seconds, also actually, to the, to, almost to the millisecond. Yeah. Um, on, on a distributed file system, right? So that, that's a big thing. We, we have customers that have a compilation environment that they, they need to ingest data, untar it, and then analyze it. Only the part of ingesting a, a, a bundle of small files that like a tar contains and, and, and extracting it on a distributed file system give them such a big headache that they, do, they don't even want to go there. And uh, what or, we show them is... Or Git clone or basically any DevOps kind of operation where people have relegated out of the NFS use cases and are using either DAS or a local file system of, of RISAN if they have to back it up. That's exactly what I was asking about the general purpose IT workloads because mm -hmm. I'm looking at that going DevOps is a perfect match because we've got lots of places with tons and tons of little files therefore tons and tons of metadata and all the rest that goes We didn't mention it a lot. You don't need to configure anything for large blocks, small blocks. It's 